my mind right now, bro. I've been thinking all right. tell me, about tell me. all these things. I wish I, I wish I was one of those people that took the time to get quotes out and be like, Sam Presti said, sure. said this, this, and this on this date. But we all always known that like because he said it a lot, that there'd be a moment when he went all in. And not necessarily hmm. like, okay, we're gonna go use our future up, but he's gonna go add some people to help make a playoff push. And sure. I started thinking about the average age of the players that he just got in you know, Gordon hmm. Haywood and Hayward, Hayward, <laughs> Bismarck, Love Bismarck, Yumbo, and um, Mike yep. Muscala, and they're all in their 30s. Sure. They all sure. still can play. And they're all what? A little bit. They're all forwards and centers. So. so, like, how do you feel about this idea that, like, this is in a way, like, Sam Presti going for it? Like, it's a Sam Presti move. It's maybe we're never going to see a bigger move by Sam Presti in for a single year adding to a squad because most of the time they might not need this. Like this could be sure. Cause in the past it was what, who did he add? Karan Butler, Derek Fisher, um, different players Young like that. Raiders. That were like end of their career, a little bit like Gordon Hayward sure. and these other guys. But I feel like it's different with Gordon. I feel like Mike can still sure. play. Like this isn't like these guys are washed. But mm -mm. how do you feel about these add-ons? Do you think in a way that this is going to be enough to push us into the conference finals? Well, do they not matter? Before, before we took our, our break, we talked about the trade deadline and what it meant to us. Um, I, I, I want to re reify, re blah, 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 it doesn't matter. Whatever that word is, I just want to go back and I just want to say what I said there because I still think it's true. We will know exactly what Sam Presti wants with this draft and the off season by what small trades he makes during the trade deadline. And I think it was quite obvious, like whether he goes to the draft and he gets two big guys to help out with the, the big, uh, big man load down there. Or if he goes to the draft and gets a forward, like somebody like, um, I don't know, um, Williams is little brother. Uh, you know, we could go out there and we could fill these holes pretty pretty fucking easily through the draft but what sam presti also let us know through what who he went out and got is he's looking for maturity he's looking for leadership and i think that's a key to exactly where this is going from here is that he values a veteran leader on in this locker room more than anybody anything else at this point and it's because we've seen guys like nick collison lead the locker room and help these guys settle down. And when things aren't right, to help them settle down in the aspect. So somebody like Gordon Hayward is, is a perfect opportunity for these guys to, you know, surround him and support him. Because at this point, if he starts stepping up, then you could see like these, these slight moves that Sam Presti will make beginning of every season in the trade deadlines that aren't necessarily massive moves, but are to clear space and to also add something that could be significant that's a veteran player to the run. I've noticed since Gordon joined the team, right? He's been playing pretty mm -hmm. much every night. He took a few, sure. you know, before the All-Star break off, but and he's also been averaging, you know, more minutes than pretty much anybody else off the bench on a regular basis. No. Sure. That's a personal assessment. Somebody can tell me I'm wrong. I I've, I've just at a glance here, right? He's up and, he's up there every night. Right. And I feel like coach is saying he thinks he can be that leader off the bench, the leader of the bench squad. And maybe that bench squad needed that. And you can consolidate, sure. consolidate all those fringe rotation players for one guy that can lead that bench squad. I feel like that's really the right thing. But the question is how much ball does Gordon have left? Like, is he, Someone who's just out but there because of his leadership much, capabilities, or is he there because he can really hoop still? Okay, so Gordon's about like thirty four, something like that, thirty three, something like that, in that age range. Age range. Right. In that range. Um, I, I I go back to this all the time: is how long can you get an old player to continue playing in his career if he's playing fifteen minutes on average every single night? And and for me, that that's an indefinite. Like I, this goes hmm. back to <laughs> people are going to hate me about this, but this goes back to LeBron James coming out about little Bronny coming out of college. He's not saying it's about where he high pick. It's about who wants to take the time to develop him. 
right? And to me, this is a direct look at Sam Presti. This is this is LeBron looking at Sam Presti and saying, draft my son. Right? Draft my son. Because you're looking at this aspect of what's happening, right, in Oklahoma City, and you're and you're seeing even the best players, even the, the media, they all recognize what's happening. Everybody wants their child. Everybody wants their, their kid to have the best opportunity to succeed. And if people are looking at Oklahoma City and saying, this is our best opportunity to succeed, right? By having somebody like Gordon Haywood in there for 15 minutes a night, it proves to LeBron that he could go to a team, help his child develop, pitch 15, 20 minutes a night, and continue his career. And, and, and this is why it's important, because if Oklahoma City can be successful with Gordon Haywood, it opens the door did it for again. any veteran that's in Sorry. that 33 to 34-year-old range that says, I need to restart my career, but I only want to put in 20, 25 minutes a night at this point in my career. And that's what Oklahoma City is so good at. You, you said it twice, bro. You said Haywood twice. Sorry. Damn it. <laughs> We're going to get it right, guys. <laughs> How are we so cursed Dude, that we can't even say I don't know, hey man. word instead of hey wood, bro? I don't know. I think it's because we probably. Gordon, I owe you a honest. beer. Every single time, <laughs> every single time I miss say your, go, word, uh, your name, I will anyway, buy you a um, beer. There's a play that I saw that I want to talk about that made me think maybe this guy's got some ball left. There hasn't been a lot of them. Let's just be honest. Like, he. He looks like he's thinking a lot. He's still injured. Not, he's still getting better. Right. But, you know, he hasn't gotten comfortable yet. That's fine. We want to hold back on any judgment. But there was a, a, ball, uh, a, a play where he got a, a steal, and he dribbled up in transition yeah. and knocked down a three. Um, yeah. Against the Blazers. And I was like... <laughs> Doing Gordon stuff, bro. Yeah, like... Okay, so we have some rookies that can make some plays like that a little bit. We have some second-year players that can make some plays like that. But really... Like, not a lot of guys can do that. Aaron Wiggins can make that play, but maybe not exactly. Like, what Gordon's doing out there sure. is a lot the same way that we saw Mike Muscala be a leader for those forwards, mm. you know, in the past. Mm -hmm. I think here we are, and we're looking at it like there's a lot of things that these young guys have to learn. Where There are buckets yeah. where maybe we're not thinking about opportunities because they're just happening so fast. So True. You know, with that opportunity to improve, I know that he's going to be someone that, that we want to keep around because of a leadership perspective. But can it get to the point in the playoffs where he's averaging, you know, 12, 15 points a game? I think so. Oh, I think he's got yes. that. In yes. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's always been so good at complicated offenses, bro. Yeah. And that's what the Oklahoma City Thunder offense is. Is as complicated. Is it taking some time? Yeah. But if coach didn't believe in him, then he wouldn't be giving him the minutes that he does. Like he's getting more minutes right now than Mischich, um, yeah, it's crazy. Trey, or Trey yeah, yeah. and yeah. you know, like he's getting all, he's still getting more minutes than them combined right now. So even if it's not a lot, to me, like Coach believes in him and knows that this is somebody that you don't take for granted. If you have an opportunity to help him get back, he'll take a family friendly deal to stay in Oklahoma City. I mean, think about it. If you're a veteran right now. And you're looking at Oklahoma City and saying, I can make $12 million a year for two years or three years, right? So, you know, three-year, $36 million deal, which is, you know, chump do change, doable. right? Yeah. But you're competing in the playoffs every year. So you're going to add another 2 or $3 million to that. You know what? Like, maybe that's worth it. Maybe that's worth it for a veteran player to sit there After and be like... The Hornets? Hell yeah, dude. Oh, or or even the 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 uh, Celtics, bro. The Celtics treated treated him like shit. They treated him like, like shit. I mean, like spit on him, shit. Yeah, I mean, so obviously there's that like the abused puppy mentality, abused dog mentality, where it's like, hey, you found I found a good home. I go look for one that may not be good. They may tell you all the right things to get you to come there, but Oklahoma whatever. City is a perfect place to raise a family. Yeah, I mean, so, it really is. How do you feel about the way that, like, you see other teams starting to kind of, like, make these transitions? And you can sure. kind of see the future of the NBA with some of these young squads coming out. Um, 
do you think anybody has a head start at catching up with the Thunder right now, or is it really just you hmm. know, it's going to be the Thunder's next decade or what? Well, I I think that there was a couple of East teams that were really young that I was excited about. Uh, you, you can't pre- you know pretend that Orlando is not exciting at number four in the East right now. Um, yeah. uh, but besides Orlando, I would say East is pretty shitty as far as young teams go. Um, young young teams young. in the yeah, but kind of is the right word. Um, but young teams mm-hmm. in the West though, like man, this is what gets me excited because our our West is going to be beautiful in a, in a couple of years. You've got the Houston Rockets, which are going to be great. Uh, a couple of years. I think you're going to have Utah be great in a couple of years uh, because Utah's still not done trading some of their players and assets that they have, and they're going to continue to get better uh, through the draft like they always do uh, with Danny Ainge there. Uh, and then I think you got to seriously look at the San Antonio Spurs, even though I fucking hate the Spurs, but I think you got to look at them if they are able to draft properly and get some good players around Victor in the next seven years, we'll see them, you know, do some damage in the playoff. Did I say that right? Seven years? Yeah. <laughs> Probably, man. I mean, seriously, they could do some damage in the playoffs in two years if they get two good rookies. But, like, everybody knows that it takes time to draft the players properly. And so if you're going to sit here and you're going to say that Oklahoma City isn't going to draft players properly, then you're crazy. Getting those, you know, number one and number two picks are re- is really hard whenever it you're... Is. You know, San Antonio's has okay. I'm sorry. Chance. Who has San Antonio picked point. properly in I the last ten picks? Who is the San Antonio start. picked properly? Josh Victor. Pino. Oh, sorry, Victor. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> right in the nuts. Um, uh, so, but that's what I'm saying is it's been Victor. Like everybody else, they could have found in every single draft that's happened since Jeremy Shohan. Sure, they could have found another another Jeremy. They could have found another. Dude, I, it goes down the line. Have had J Dub, he was right there. I know, and like that's the thing that's so crazy about this is that like if they draft properly, if they draft properly, I know, then we could see them in the playoffs doing damage. If not, then it's going to turn into another Dallas Mavericks situation Dude, where Lucas is dominating the NBA, but I he know. has nobody around him. It's it's a Texas problem. You know what I mean? Like. It, it's right now yeah, you, but, you see these elite stars with without any supporting cast and you're like are they going to drag this team to another 40 win season but like here's the deal though like my question about what's happening right now in san antonio is like is it even fucking necessary i get people will look at this roster and be like man they're not loaded they're not like they used to be and stuff but like i think pop made it a lot worse than it had to be i really do i think his like his style of Bro. like experimentation and his approach of I don't know, like I just feel like it's time to move on. And I know people who who are in San Antonio the Popovich tank. People know, are gonna recognize back but in they, a couple of years about the Popovich tank. It's different I get it. it's a different one than um Presti. We've seen it happen before, you know, to get David Robin I mean to get probably but no, it was definitely to get um Tim Duncan. But here's my thing about it though right like if you had a young coach sure. someone like mark degno who was sure. put installing this offense that will i get everybody's like oh pop has something up his sleeves like he might just be a crazy old man like we don't know that right now and i, I shouldn't say stuff like this i know that i piss off a lot of people but my point is right now one just of the biggest acid, assets bro. that the thunder have one of the biggest assets that they have is a young coach in Mark Dignall. And his ability sure. to orchestrate this offense that mm-hmm. is one of the best in the league and have an entire coaching staff and training staff that's elite but also young. And then yeah. you have San Antonio and you're like, what? What? why isn't this going to one of their young guns who are really capable who can install a modern offense that can actually make this team like compete. Like when you saw the team against Oklahoma city, they came out and they competed at a really high level. They're capable of that. They're just not sure given the opportunity. And I think a lot of it is sort of like you said, the Popovich tank, it's like kind of on purpose. And I feel like that's not healthy for anybody, but it might work out. Who am I to judge or question anything that like that this guy does. But I, but my question is like, if, how would you feel, right, if we were doing a rebuild and we didn't have Mark Degnall, like, running it? You know what I feel like? 
Dude, like, it would be scary. I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Because imagine if Coach Donovan was still our coach. Dude, I see that. That it would be sad. Like, look at what's going on there in, in Chicago. It's like mm. I, he's he's such an out of touch touch coach, and I get that people probably don't agree with me. But I just see someone that like he was out of touch when he was in Oklahoma City. He's then you have Mark Degnall. And you're like, this is what you need. And this isn't only basketball. You see it happen in other sports where they, they hire a young coach and the young coach is really relatable and the players really yeah, want to play well for that coach and they install this modern offense that nobody has ever seen before and they don't necessarily have an answer for at first. And if you're an innovator and you continue to learn, then the, everything's available to you. Like that knowledge can be passed on. And I just, I, I wonder when they're going to realize that it's time to give somebody else the reins because you can't expect him to be there. Like, I don't know, dude. He makes Joe Biden look young. It's right. Sorry, I shouldn't do that. I, dude. I know I piss everybody. No, no. <laughs> you get, you get, you get. Um, I, I, I look at uh, Popovich, and I, I say this is that um, um, there's great coaches that coach too long because they're trying to make a point. Popovich should have stopped a couple years ago, and I'm just being straight up honest. Like he should have stopped when he was on top a couple years ago. They'd probably still have Kawhi there. They would have a, quite a bit of nice team still there and and building there. My my point about that and why that's important of what why we bring this up is that <clears throat> Sam Presti saw that. I don't think it's a coincidence that Sam Presti recognized that the wrong coach and the wrong error, the old whatever you want to say, could destroy your 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 team before it even gets going. And that's why it was important when we pushed the reset button on this, that the reset button was really fucking pushed. Right. Like it was like, here you go, Coach D, fucking figure it out. We know right, it's going to exactly. take you time, but right, we've exactly. got the time. And go out and compete and go out and try to win, even though you're outmatched. And I feel like Pop does this other thing, which is like, like oh, compete, but we're not going to give you everything you have. And compete, and we're going to tie your left, your right hand behind your back. So you have, and like, it's kind of like, I remember when I was coaching, sometimes I'd make the team go like no dribble offense. And it's like, oh, yeah. sometimes All you the tie, you take away a strength. And I feel like pop is just like doing this, like from this experimental way. And everybody's like sitting back being like, well, you just got to give him space. I'm like, or hire the smartest assistant coach you have on your bench to be the head coach and tell him, go out as win as many games as you can and see, and see what he can do and see how connected he can make this team and watch them grow together as a unit. But whatever. You know, mm. Pop's got the championships. You, you know what and I, so you, if he wants to shit the bed at the end of his life, let him. You know, so, I've I've been saying this for a while, but um, honestly, who they need over there? Becky Hammond, bro. Bet no, Dave Bliss. Okay. He, Dave yeah. Bliss would turn that entire entire organization <laughs> around. He's that too good of a coach. He would he would help. Uh, Here's Victor. what I want to say He would about help that. the defense. He's so good. So this is good. the genius of Sam Presti, right? Right, like if you go out and you hire assistant coaches from other people's benches, especially like ones that are winning championships and stuff, they have this thing called yeah. pedigree. And once you have some pedigree, yeah. then you're a quick riser. And a quick riser gets hired oh, up so really good. quickly. And so what yeah. Presti did is he went out and find, found these people that were really good communicators and had potential to be great coaches, but had no pedigree. Dave Bliss has no pedigree. Mm. Like his pedigree is entirely mm. with the Thunder. So if the Thunder go on to win championships, people might hire him off the bench. But nobody's going to hire somebody who's That's never it. been an assistant for coach. And same with Mark Dagnall. Who's coming knocking on the door until today? Now that we're great. And guess what? When you hire people who don't have pedigree, then you teach them how to be a unit. They're, like it's really hard mm -hmm. to knock on that door, and it's something that like You're right. Pop always had You're a right. problem with. His best assistants were always getting you know hired off of his bench, and so he was always having to reset his offense, reset his defense, having to restart here and there and there. So that, I I get why everybody's like, oh, you just got to let this guy, he's the greatest of all time, do his thing. But I've seen mm -hmm. in every sport when you have this the coach who's like the goat, they go too long. You know what I mean? And and it ends up like becoming yeah. this wicked backlash. And um I just like we've talked a lot about Victor at different points. And like, dude, I am he's so much better than I thought he would be at this point. So, I'm so good. We're just lucky to be in a time where we get to see a player like him play the game at the level that he's playing and the amount of like and excitement that's 
attached to that. Like I'll say this too, Chet's even better than I thought it would be. So they both are so far exceeding that my expectations for them on their rookie year that it just hmm. I can't I couldn't possibly be more so good. and there were so many people at times who were saying you can't compare their games and I thought well you know what maybe you can't I've seen enough to tell you you can't and you should just sit back and say each one of these guys brings their own special brand to the game and when they're both at their sure. peaks when you look back and they're like 28 years old and they're at their peaks right what yeah. we're going to see is some of the best basketball that the history of the game has ever seen. And mm. I just hope, honestly, I, I, this sounds stupid, but I hope San Antonio figures out a way to make this transition smooth so that we are seeing mm. conference finals of the Thunder and the Spurs again. Because those are the, I yeah. mean, those are the best memories. You, ha- you have series against the Spurs that would make you go insane. Like where we get down two games yeah. and we come back and win the next four. Like that, there's nothing like mm-hmm. that feeling. Or we get down two, then we win two, and then we lose two. Like you, yep. you never know what's going to happen with the Spurs Thunder series. So I think it's on them to make a move. And I'm not saying because they'll lose Victor. Like I just hope we don't see another Dallas. I hope we're not sitting there looking back and saying, well, look at what we see now. We're seeing this incredible superstar a revolving door of supporting casts and, and they can't figure it out. That would be sad. We, we never questioned how good Victor was going to be. I want to make sure that we're clear on that. We questioned I, whether or not San Antonio was going to do anything or it, was going to be able to do anything to protect him. I questioned whether or not and he'd be when this we good. Saw him, now, I'll say that. I thought he would eventually him, be this good, but maybe not now. But when we saw him in this um, summer league and he set that screen up top and his knee yeah, buckled. knee buckled, I know. And I said, if they send him up setting those screens, he is going to get injured. And then all the San Antonio people went bonkers about what I, was gonna, what I said. But yeah, how many you... times have I seen that screen at the top of the key that was it's no, unprotected since? I haven't Twice. Seen it. Twice. An entire season. That is how many times it's been. It's not even significant an amount for me to even say because – Coach saw it. We all saw it. It was like, damn, that's not where you want him. He's so out of position at trying to set that screen right there with his feet wide and all this other stuff. Like, you don't want him doing that. He is unprotected. So they figured it out. And that's kudos to San Antonio. And I'm glad they did because, like you said, I want to see them for a long time. I want to see them forever, bro. I want to see this Anyways, matchup. Western dude, Conference, baby. I got to go, man. I got to go pick up my wife from the airport and I okay. get to see her for the first time in a week. So I'm pretty fucking all stoked. Right. So. We appreciate you guys. We love you. And uh, we'll be back very soon. Peace.